Well, welcome to the Leadership Lessons podcast. I have Dr. Mark Jury with me today, which is really exciting. Mark's down here doing a bit of a conference uh, with us. So I've stolen him for a podcast. Now, Mark is a doctor. He actually has two PhDs, which is amazing. One is in linguistics and the other one in theology and uh, with a real study of Islam, which mm. uh, Mark is known for as a bit of an expert. Uh, he's a pastor uh, and, and an academic, a uh, a writer and a speaker and lots of different things. So uh, he's a great guy. We have a great friendship and I really appreciate your time, Mark, and joining us today. Great to be with you today, Kurt. It's great. Mm -hmm. So tell me, uh, how did you become a pastor and an ac academic? How did you get into this kind of field of work as a young man and, and why? Well, my father was a pastor and my mother's father as well. Uh, we were brought up as Christians and I went through that period in my life where I just wasn't sure what God wanted me to do. And so I, I just went with the next thing. So I, I was doing a bachelor's degree, I did a PhD, and then I found myself um, with a postdoc fellowship and then an academic career. But I never thought it was the, the, the thing that God wanted me to do. And at one time, there was an opening uh, in America, a possible job that I could apply for. I was head of linguistics at Melbourne Uni. And um, I was just saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? Should I take this? It would be great for that career. Mm. And uh, I was driving along and I, I just pulled over to the side of the road and I said, Lord, what, what is it that you want me to do? I was, I was sort of 32 at that time. And I, I, I felt God said to me in my heart, I heard, feed my sheep. That's mm. what I felt God said to me as I stopped there by the side of the road in Melbourne. And well, I knew what that meant. So I, um, I began to study theology part-time mm. and working on the principle that you should stay where you are unless God calls you somewhere yeah, else. Yeah. So I, it's I a good went, principle. I, I was at the <laughs> Anglican Church, so we, we went through that system. So I began to study theology and told my colleagues I was quitting my job at wow. the university. They, one guy lost a bottle of whiskey. They had a bet I wouldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> it was a mistake. But uh, So tell me about linguistics, because that's fascinating. Uh, well, I mean, what does it take to be a, a linguist? Is that how you would be Yeah, a linguist. Or? Well, you have to study linguistics, which is the, it's the science of language. Yeah. You know, languages have grammar. They have rules for forming words. Uh, and so I was trained in a, in a school in the ANU that focused on descriptive linguistics. So... Many of us that were doing doctorates there were writing grammars of language. Wow. So I, I chose to work on the language of Aceh in Indonesia, which mm. became famous when the tsunami struck because oh, yeah. a couple of hundred thousand Achenese people died in that tsunami. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I went there and um, doors opened and I found myself living in a village and eating lots of fish and rice. And, um, and I'd be listening to people writing down, you know, Wow. Uh, oh, that's an interesting grammatical construction. I'll, I'll write that down. And I would interview people and ask questions. And at the end of that time, I, I wrote a grammar of, of the language of wow. Aceh. Mm. And, and, and that gave you, uh, was that your first introduction to Islam? It was because the Aceh is called the gate of Mecca or the veranda of Mecca. Oh, wow. It's, um, it was the stopping off point for the pilgrims going to Mecca. But it's also the most Islamicized area in Indonesia. And after I left, the government actually gave it concessions to have Sharia law for certain mm. offences. And, and, you know, they, they like whip people publicly for wow. immodesty. And, and, and they have a special status in Indonesia because of their Islam. They're considered to be very fanatical. Mm. They fought um, a long 30, 40 year jihad against the Dutch. Mm. Very proud of their the desire for independence and winning that. It was one of the first parts of Indonesia after mm. the Japanese occupation. So to claim independence. So yeah, Islam is like a very deeply imprinted in the culture and the language there. Mm -hmm. So I lived with Muslims in a Muslim village uh, in that, fully immersed in that Islamic mm. context when I was living in Aceh. Was that a bit of a culture shock? Like were you a young man when you went there? How I, old were you? I, I was. I was, uh, I was 21, 22. Oh really? Wow, yeah, wow, 22. wow. So, so that would have been quite a change for Australia. It was Australia. big. And I was a Christian. Yeah. And they knew that. But in some ways it was easier than in, in Australia. And okay. What's easier there is that everyone believes in God and they love to talk about God. Yeah. So yeah. there's no embarrassment or kind of cultural cringe. Yeah. And they would always try and convert me. So <laughs> I had lots of conversations about God with yeah. them. Whereas in Australia, it's like, oh, you know, is it okay to talk about that? And yeah. people don't feel comfortable. 
Uh, so in many ways, there were some real blessings to be okay. there in that time. Well, yeah. I think from what I understand, sometimes um, people see Australians or Westerners as a bit odd because we don't talk about spiritual things. Well, we think we're very, I suppose, smart. And then a lot of other nations go, well, where's the spiritual conversation? Or what about God? Or all those yeah. kind of... It's, it can actually be seen as a bit odd, but we're not, you know, we're, this is the water we swim in, so it's very familiar to us. So. It's so true. And, I mean, for them, it was the most natural thing in the world to talk about mm. God or yeah. ask you what you believed. In fact, they would often ask me that and try and convert me, you know, become a Muslim. I'd say, why? they say, well, it's good. <laughs> And then they sometimes would say, become a Muslim and marry a, an Achenese girl. <laughs> so I would say, well, I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm two metres and the Achenese girls are like, you know, a fair bit shorter than that. Uh, six foot seven I am. And, and so one person said, oh, we could join two together. <laughs> and I said, I don't think my mother would be too happy about that. So, yeah, we had, we had some fun. Oh, um, that's great. Yeah, it was refreshing being in a society that took God seriously. Yeah, yeah. And people were very hospitable to me. They loved the idea I was learning the language. Yes. So, so lots of doors opened. But so, so they didn't have a grammar at all, and you built that? or They didn't have a written grammar. I mean, okay. they have the grammar, but yes. in their minds, the language is organized. Sorry, written grammar. Yeah, yeah. but there, there wasn't a written textbook on how the language was organized. So, so, yeah. so, the, so there was, sorry, forgive my ignorance. So there's literally no books written in their language. There were books written, so they had a script. Yeah, um, and they at first they use Arabic script and then they use Roman script. So a lot of their books were poetry. So they had this amazing tradition of epic poetry. So you could you could buy um, uh, books full of epic poetry, uh, and they they would perform it as well. So they had a literary tradition. Mm -hmm. It was amazing, actually. Sometimes you get these poetry matches where two poets would insult each other for hours on end, mm. making up poetry and enchanting mm. at each other. Mm. So they had a rich tradition, but no one had said, what is the grammar of this language? How is okay. it organized? You know, what are the parts of speech? Um, what's the word order? Uh, all of that. So mm. um, the sound system. So I had to study it. I learnt the language, but wow. I was also analyzing it and fitting it into the theory of linguistics. Like, so, yeah. so someone from another part of the world who was a linguist could read the grammar mm. and they would understand how the language was organized. Yeah, wow. It's really an exercise of entering into someone else's head and, and working out how it's furnished. Like, how mm. is what's the inner system of the language? Mm. What's mm. an elegant way of presenting its, its mm. logic? And with worldview and, and, and Christianity or spiritual things, how, sorry to put you on the spot, but how does language fit there? Like, it, it must, as a linguist, give you a much more of an insight to people's even psychology when they talk, or, or maybe you hear words differently that people say than other people do. Um, do. Do you feel like you understand a deeper meaning of, of language and how we use it? I'm very aware that we're trapped in our language. Mm. There's things that we can say because of our language and things we can't say. Yeah. Um, you know, in Achenese, the word for believe and obey was the same word. Okay, yeah. Uh, so it changes the definition, essentially. Both, both, if you use it in either sense, it's different. You know, it's, it, it, they can say things with that that we can't, and we can say things that's hard to say mm. in that language. Uh, one of my teachers who's an expert in meaning, she wrote a, a really interesting book called Trapped in English about how English controls our thought. Yes. You know, um, a word like freedom is, d doesn't actually exist with exactly that meaning in other European languages. That's... That word and what it means to us in English is very based on the culture of England and its history. On the other hand, um, the word for love in English, which has similar, you know, there's Liebe in German and, you know, so on in other European languages, that meaning is really influenced by the Bible. Like mm. the, the, the biblical definition of, of love um, agape has shaped the meaning of love in English. Mm, mm. And you, you really become aware of that if you say you study Achenese or another language and you mm. say, how do you translate love? And, you know, the, I've been working with an Iranian church and the Iranians don't have a word that easily translates the word love. It's actually oh. quite difficult. So if you're, if you're preaching about the love of God, you have to unpack the fact that they don't have a word that matches mm. what the New Testament says and you have to explain what agape is. Uh, and define it. So yeah, that that really. So does. what would their understanding of love be? Well, they have their language? they have two words, uh, neither of them the same as English. Love in English means sort of that you you want something good to happen to somebody, mm -hmm. 
and that's your desire, and it's not because they would do something good for you. Um, As that sacrificial it's aspect. A, it's a yeah. generous, it's a generous mm. love. You could love your enemies, you know. Whereas in Iranian, uh, in Farsi or Persian, um, there's a word, mahabat, that means really compassion. Mm -hmm. And there's another one uh, which, which really is, is passion, like mm -hmm. a love between a man and a woman. Yeah. Um, but that sort of generous love that you want good things to happen to somebody else mm -hmm. and uh, it's not based on self-interest, uh, that there isn't an obvious word for that. So mm -hmm. people use the compassion word. But as soon as you say God loves you and He has compassion on you, that shifts the meaning of that. Mm, mm, mm. So it's yeah, that really interests me. Uh, let me give you another example. Um, there's actually no word in Hebrew for thank, in biblical Hebrew for thank you. Okay. And so when you read, give thanks to the Lord. Yeah. In Hebrew, it actually says acknowledge who God is. Mm. The, the concept of thanking is actually not. Many languages have no word for thank you, mm. but we in English we hear that as thanks. Mm. Because it's part of our culture, mm. and but in fact, it actually means to acknowledge who God is, mm. to to mm. to know who God is. So yeah, those things are really, much deeper. It is much than just deeper. like thanks you did something for me. Yeah, I think it feels like you're repaying a debt. Yeah, but it's not about that. It's 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 acknowledge in that the Lord is great. You know, mm. that give thanks to the Lord is you know you are God, you are majestic. Mm. So those what's lost in translation and cha like translations. Um, add meaning, and mm. they also subtract meaning, mm. and, and I find that really fascinating. Yeah, it is. Well, and as a pastor, like when you get into studying the Bible and the original languages with Greek and Hebrew, you do realise there's some limitation with English. When you actually look at the original Greek, especially the New Testament, to understand it, you realise, oh, as I've grown up learning scriptures or memorising them, uh, some of the, some of the English words that we use to describe um, or that our translations are in are, are quite limited. There's a lot more. There's it's, it's a bit of an iceberg. You kind of got the English words. That's right. like, well, actually, the, the original language and the writer have meant so much more. You know, and there's all these dynamics um, to a particular word. Or like you've said, uh, with, with love even, we know that the, the Greeks had, had three different yes. words for love. So there's different angles on that. Where for yes. us, love is just this one big thing that's kind of confusing, can mean many different things from something that's erotic to something that's loving an enemy. We actually had different words that help you understand it deeper. Yes. And so even as a, a Christian or someone wanting to understand the Bible, the importance of not just taking the words on the page at that surface level at times and learning to understand what they mean. The deeper yeah, when, when, meaning is important. When Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? Mm. Which of the loves is used there? Exactly. And uh, is used different words, mm. you know, so uh, they're, they're, yeah, those things really, really well, interesting. Well, isn't it, doesn't he use two Greek words, uh, do you love me, do you love me, and then a, a different Greek word yeah, for the third it. one? Yeah. That's right. Where we would never read, You'd we never would never understand it. that. We just, just go love, 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 love. Yeah. But actually something really significant is happening there. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, those things really interest me. And I think it's it's been really helpful as a preacher sometimes to draw out those meanings. It would be. And also to be aware, as I said, that we're trapped in English. And yes. It's the international language, but it's not the language of thought. Okay. It's the language of thought for English speaking people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, and so I, I, I love to ask, well, what does, what does that really mean? And do you know German? I studied German, yeah, for many years. So you yeah. can speak German as well? I can. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, how many languages can you speak? Oh, it's hard to say. Like <laughs> I, I've learned lots of bits and pieces of different languages. Oh, that's amazing. Did you find you always had a brain for that? or I wouldn't say I'm the greatest language learner, but I'm just always interested in language. Because you only grew up speaking English, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I studied German. Then I studied Germanic languages. So okay. I studied Old Norse Viking language. And wow. Middle, middle High German, Medieval German and different things. I did some French. I, I had a term of Lithuanian once. Wow. <laughs> I've forgotten it all. I learned a bit of Cambodian, Khmer. I forgot that too. Wow. So, well, I'm sure it's back there. <laughs> it's somewhere. It it's somewhere. <laughs> you needed to pull it out. Yeah, Arabic, Hebrew, Greek. So I, 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 I've, I've not learned a lot of languages. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, I, I, I barely know English, so you're doing a lot better than me. So, so tell me a, a little about, you lived with this village Arch, uh, in Arche in Sumatra, yep. uh, and, and that was really exposed you to Islam, and then you went on and did a second PhD after linguistics in theology looking at Islam. So 
So, so can you just tell us a bit about Islam, a bit about the basics? What, 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 what is it about? What's the essence of that yeah. uh, worldview? I, look, I loved living in Aceh, and I really enjoyed living with Muslim people. Mm. But I sort of had a sense that I didn't want, at that point, to study Islam systematically. It was just, I was relating at the level of people and friendship, and they would what they would say I would receive. Mm. But after 9-11, I realized I needed to understand Islam for myself, uh, in a systematic way. Like, I need to bring my full mind and attention to the task. So, Islam is structured very differently to Christianity. Uh, uh, it, one way into it is say, what, what's the Islamic view of the human problem? Mm -hmm. And the Christian view of the human problem is the, the problem is sin, which is a breach of relationship with God and with others. And the solution to that is to heal the relationship, which requires forgiveness. And, mm -hmm. and we call the result salvation. Mm -hmm. But the Islamic view is not that. The Islamic view is that human beings are slaves of Allah. They should be obedient to Allah. And their fundamental problem is uh, ignorance of the mm -hmm. commands and also a, a tendency to be easily led astray. The Islam is a lot about being led astray and staying on the right path. And the solution to ignorance and being led astray is guidance. Mm -hmm. Islam provides guidance. And the result of being rightly guided according to Islam is success. And so the call to prayer that rings out from the minaret, it says, you know, there's no God but Allah. Um, and it says, come to success, come to success. Mm. So Islam promises success to the rightly guided. And, and then you might say, well, what is guidance? Well, in Islam, it's basically following Muhammad's example and his teaching. So he is, his life is the guidance. Yeah, okay. And that's sort of embedded in a tradition of his story and what he did and said and the Quran. And this is built up into a system of laws. So Islam's job is really to impose guidance on people so that they will be on the right path. Mm -hmm. And in that, what's different too is that there's a lot of emphasis in Christianity on choice, on choosing, mm -hmm. be, you know, choosing to take up your cross and follow Jesus. In Islam, the, the, the emphasis is not on choice, it's on... It's on um, submission. Mm. So the idea of Islam, Islam means submission. It actually means the submission of a slave who surrendered. Yeah. Uh, so Islam has a system of guidance that's imposed by the Islamic State on the community of Muslims, submitters, so that they would be successful in mm -hmm. this life and the mm -hmm. next. It's a very, very different understanding of the problem and very the solution. Different, yeah. And it leads to a very different sort of society. We can see how the, um, the justification for the laws, therefore, would be very easily, easy. If we're guiding you, the submitters, uh, then the justification of the means to the end of guiding you um, could become potentially corrupt or overbearing or... Uh, yeah, or, or run away with things like we end up with with 9-11 and things like that, where essentially it's, it's trying to um, force that, 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 that view or that way of doing things, where Christianity is very different, or should be different, although sometimes we've all experienced situations where there's some forcing and some religion, and yeah. we've had many bad stories of that in our own worldview, haven't we? But uh, I think you're right, that, that, that essentially Christ calls us to follow him, but we get the choice to not follow if we don't want to. Yeah, uh, God has no grandchildren, so each generation needs to make its own commitment, mm. which is so different mm. from, from the Islamic framework where um, the believers have a responsibility to impose guidance. And mm. I think those 9-11 bombers, they did have that hope that there would the, there'd be the victory for the right guidance, and they mm. were attacking the unguided ones who were... Mm who are not believers. So it's a so very people, divided world. If people are ig ignorant, what, what are they, what, what is Islam concerned that people will be, you know, uh, if they're unguided, will, will go off into? What, what, what's the concern? Well, they're, they're ignorant, so they're, they're not doing what God asks of them. So they're corrupt and perverse. Mm -hmm. And they're doing wrong in lots of different ways. They're not following the Sharia. Mm -hmm. um, they're unclean in a sense. Um, they're committing sin that would anger God without knowing it because they haven't been informed. And they're, they're so essentially it's a, moral, it's, a, a moral. it's a moral code. Like your slave master, Allah is the slave master. And a common Islamic name is Abdullah, which means slave of Allah. We're meant to be obedient slaves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we're successful if we're obedient. And 
if we're not obedient, then our worth is very poor, really. We're, we're, we're kind of lawless slaves, which is a really yeah. bad state to be yeah. in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, fascinating. And, and what, what do you think the... So let's contextualise this to here, Australia. Mm. What, what does the average Aussie think of Islam? Because they definitely don't think that, that great definition <laughs> you just gave, and probably don't even understand that Islam means submission. Or it, it seems... I, I, I would say to the average Aussie, it just seems so foreign and so just different to the way they think or believe or even live because as I understand it it's a very um, you know to, to be Islamic is to be Turkish or Arabic or it's very much ethnicity is tied to your and it's also a political system as well isn't it it's kind yeah of there's no real religion. difference between religion and politics yeah, there's no there's church not. and state no there isn't it's this it's one and the same there's, that separation is a Christian idea yeah you know, the world that the world and the church are distinct is in the Bible. And it's sort of, even with Moses and Aaron, Aaron was the religious leader, Moses was the political leader. Mm. Um, and they had a separation in the, in the kingship in Israel between the kings and the prophets and the priests. Mm. But Islam puts it, all, puts it all together. I think people in Australia think two things about Islam. One is they're unnerved. You know, like they, they see the jihadi crying Allahu Akbar and killing people. Mm. And they think that's not good. But then they have another thought, which is completely different, which is that all religions are the same. It doesn't mm. matter what you believe. Mm. And, you know, to you, your religion, and to me, mine, as the, as the Quran actually says. Mm. So they, um, they're caught between these two, um, these two ideas. Um, Muslims uh, are okay and that there's no problem and, and that, you know, that all religions are the same. And then on the other hand, but why do they hate us? And, and I don't really like that, you mm. know. So... Mm. And, and but that people don't want to give voice to that, so they they're really caught. They are actually caught in an unresolved word worldview clash. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They, 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 There's cognitive dissonance there, and they don't quite know what to do with it. Mm. That we're we're trapped in a, in our own in our own worldviews that are not really ready to and to understand this issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and when so I was telling you before, like I play soccer with a bunch of guys over the years who are Muslims, and uh, you know it's interesting. Um, I would assume that when they come to Australia, it's a little bit different. Yeah, it feels like there's a bit of that um, moderation and fitting in with Aussie culture and that that tends to come, which is very, again, probably the, um, the cognitive uh, dissonance you're talking about is very different to what we see on the TV or the 9-11 or the news reports of Taliban or whatever. And then you have this mate at work who's a Muslim and he's fine and you go out for a beer or whatever. So I think that... That, 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 well, why does that happen, Mark? That, that, does it, do they just get westernised? Well, I think there's several or... reasons. One is um, many Muslims who came to Australia in the first place didn't necessarily come here for religious purposes. They came here for a different life. So some of those that came actually were already fairly secular, and that's why okay. they, they choose to come. Not all, but some. They want a new life. They want a new life for their children. And so they, they get involved in Australian life on that basis. Then you've got the pressure of Australian secular, secularism culture going to school. And so some younger Muslims get a little bit lost from the religion. They get mm. separated from it and they sort of settle in. And that happens in America and Australia. Mm. Um, but you also have the other pressure that is uh, a, a kind of religious purism that's trying to revive Islam in Australia. So you you can get people becoming more religious when they mm. come here. So mm. I think it's very varied. And different ethnic groups are very varied. And Muslims are not all the same. And Muslims from different contexts will come here with a very different mindset. Mm. I mean, I've worked a lot with Iranians, and many Iranians are, are as a distance from Islam before they come here. Yeah. Um, so some will go to mosques, but most of them won't. So they're very different, for example from Lebanese Muslims or a Saudi Muslim who might immigrate here. Yeah. So I think it, it just, it does vary a lot. And you're right, it is part of their, their cultural identity mm. to be a, a Turk is to be a Muslim. Mm. So um, that can also be a feature of secularization. Like I don't have to do anything to be a Muslim because I'm a Turk, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that's, uh, you know, that's, that's one factor as well, just how, whether it's part of their cultural identity or not. Mm -hmm. And do you think the conversation, we've had 9-11 and it was a pretty dramatic situation that really affected uh, the West significantly. Do, do you think that has, has changed now, settled down? 
or, or, or do you feel, I mean, you, you're involved in these conversations and get asked questions, or do you think the conversations moved about the concerns of terror and Islam or? Yeah, I think uh, there were two major events in the last 20 years. One was 9-11 and the other was the ISIS mm. phenomenon. And both of those caused a lot of anxiety in the West. Why do they hate us? How can they possibly think like that? Like, uh, someone woke me up on 9-11 at two, 2 in the morning and said, Mark, you've got to switch your TV on. I did. I watched it. I actually knew immediately who'd done it. Like, mm. I knew why they'd done it, mm. which was a disturbing feeling to have because I was listening to the media and everyone was saying, why would people do that? But to me, it was clear. And 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 so it's just hard for people to can, understand. Can you explain that a bit more? What, what, what was clear to you exactly? The idea that you would intentionally go to your death trying to fight against people uh, who, who you had no connection with, purely on the base of the fact that they didn't share your ideology or belief, mm. that you'd be willing to kill hundreds of people and to die yourself. I knew that was something that Islam had the capacity to generate. In yeah, people. yeah. And I'd seen it in Aceh. They, they had a history of these jihad attacks against the Dutch. And I knew enough about Islam to know that those young men believed that they would end up in paradise for this. Mm. And they believed that they were killing infidels who were going to hell. And they believed that they were advancing their cause because of it. I knew all that. Mm. I, I'm not saying that all Muslims thought that way. I'm not yeah. saying this is what Islam teaches every Muslim. But I knew that Islam had the capacity to teach yeah. people that. It could join those dots and it, create it that framework. Okay. And so... I, 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 I it wasn't a surprise to you in some ways, although it would have been a complete surprise. It was a shock, but it wasn't a surprise. Right, yeah. Like, I, I didn't believe that there was any other ideology, um, atheist or, or religious, that could produce that phenomenon in the mm. world today. Mm. Mm. Um, that, that would cause some... And I think now... Because of those events, we all have a sense that that's possible. And this is this new world we live in. There's all a sense that this could happen again or that this is, there's that capacity there. And uh, I suppose it really violates that idea of, uh, we're talking about it today in our conference, but the progressivism and we're all just going to keep getting better. It's and a challenge to that. Wars will just get less and, and surely everyone gets it now that if we're just nice and kind, we're all going to be better off. And then it really violated that, didn't it? Like in it the did. 21st century, it did. people just killing for no reason. And th as you said... Well, we the, couldn't understand their reason. Well, yeah, no grid for like why or where is this yeah. coming from? And it's I quite think it, disturbing. It, cha it challenged postmodern relativism, you know, yeah. the idea that everyone could make their own meaning yeah. um, and that meaning is just in the eye of the beholder. I think when someone kills people like that, it's like this requires more than just relativism. Like this is, someone said 9-11 killed postmodernism. Well, I don't think so, but it <laughs> certainly challenged people's thinking and mm. it challenged progressivism. I mean, people seriously thought in the 60s that God was dead, that, mm, that mm. we were about to enter an era where religion was irrelevant mm. and would be of declining, vanishing significance. Mm. And then suddenly this happens and all our habits and you know, our airport experiences change all over the world because of religion. Mm. And so, it, yeah, people had no... no con so I think it did, it did shake the tree. But um, people are tired of this. Mm. And I think as, as the ISIS... T tired of what exactly? They're tired of having to think about radical Islam. Okay. They're yep. tired of jihad. Mm. They want to move on. Yep, yep. And we, we have other things that attract our attention these days. There's Ukraine, there's the pandemic, there's mm. fears of inflation, mm. um, fears about America, Russia, China. So we, we, we this is not front and, and centre of people's At attention the moment, anymore. Yep. Okay. But I think long term... Radical Islam is no less an issue for the world than it was 20 mm. years ago. It's just that we can't endure paying attention to it for too long because we don't have answers. It's too hard to think about. We don't know why they hate us. So, yeah. so you sort of, oh, let's move on from that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So right. I definitely there's, there's, a, there's a weariness around that. Mm. So, so I wanted to ask you, Mark, we've had this little conference today and uh, you spoke, did two sessions. The first one, anthropology and talking about mm. what is man. And the second one about uh, time, which was which was fascinating. Um, so, what one of the things you spoke about with the first session in anthropology is just the importance of understanding who we are uh, as human beings. Could you talk to us a bit about that for a moment? Why is that question so critical? Who, who is man? What is man? I think that question, "Who are we?" is one of the most difficult and divisive questions in our culture today. Mm -hmm. 
everyone has a has an understanding of what it is to be human, but we differ widely mm. in, across the community in, in how we answer that. And that affects everything, everything. Mm. So the classical Christian view is that we're made in the image of God, and with that comes dignity uh, and a value, but but we are also sinful. So there's there's some damage in the human in the human nature. And, and and a lot of our Western institutions like the separation of powers in our culture is influenced by that view. Yep. You know. Um, and the value of human life uh, is, 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 is has been shaped by that view that we're made in the image of God. I think the abolition of slavery was a mm -hmm. a downstream effect of that theology. Mm. But today in our culture and in the view that's happened since the Enlightenment, I think the view is um, really that we're uh, not made in the image of God, that we, the, the point of being a human is somehow to self-realize, to, mm. to be yourself. Mm, mm. <laughs> um, and because that's the question, like what's the point of being human? Mm. What's the point of being alive? Mm. Just to say that we're a bundle of atoms swirling around, that's hardly satisfying. It's not quite enough, yeah. I mean, I could just as well be a brick, you know. Yeah. What's, <laughs> what is it that makes human being of value? And I think our, our cultural view is that yeah, um, our view in our culture is that the ability to choose, to make your own, to make something of yourself, to mm. self-realize, and that view has just gone through everything, education, everything. But from a Christian perspective, that's not a very satisfactory answer. Mm. Like, mm. I, I would say we're made in the image of God. We've got a divine calling to reflect that image and to live that out. And the message of Jesus really invites us to the fulfillment and mm. the restoration of that image mm. in, in Christ. I think it's really important for Christians to grapple with that question because mm. it, it's the fundamental issue in, in so many ways. And if you can understand that issue clearly, it, it just enables so much in terms of how to communicate with people. Yeah, yeah. And, and so for the Christian worldview, let's strip it back a bit. Like, I suppose that takes you back to Genesis. Yes. And, 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 and the biblical story beginning with God creating man. And so, 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 so who is God and then who is God? God creating man to be. Could you explain that a bit for us? You yeah, said that so, today. Yeah, so Genesis line. says we're made in the image of God. Male mm -hmm. and female, he created them. Both mm -hmm. male and female in the image of God. Um, there's that famous picture of the creation of Adam in the, on the Sistine Chapel, Leonardo da Vinci. God is reaching out to touch Adam. And they look similar. One's older and wiser and the other's younger and naked. Um, uh, so Genesis says two things about human beings. Firstly, we are made in the image of God. And secondly, in Genesis 6, it says God was very disappointed in human beings mm. because every inclination of their heart was evil. Mm. So you've got these two astounding statements that there's some equivalence with God, there's some majesty and dignity in the human condition, but there's also a, a fault of failing. Mm. And living, the, balancing that out, yeah. I think, makes huge, is, is so fundamental Mm. And actually, I think it's foundational for Western civilization. Mm. Um, but what what the secular humanist view has taken is, yes, human beings have dignity, but it's but how do you ground that? Mm. And let's just forget about evil and sin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, so we had just to go back over that. So we had, it was, it's it's a great um, it, it's brilliant how you said it today. So the Christian idea gave us dignity. Humans have dignity, and then humans have sin. Yes. So we're selfish and fallen of a problem. So the secular position at the moment is humans have dignity. We still maintain that from our Christian roots, but we've kind of lost the why. Where did that, you know, the other side of the problem come from? Why is there problems? Why is there evil? It's not that we're selfish. We're just oppressed or limited in choice. Or, or ignorant, you know. Or we don't have enough money. We don't or, have the right education, yeah. you know. We haven't had the right ideology. So how would you describe in a secular humanist mindset right now, what is the problem? If it's not, it's not me, I'm not a broken person. Well, like, how would you, how does the That's secular... That's a great question. So if you take the view that human beings are basically good, mm -hmm. which is the common view, and history's improving, that's the progressive vision, um, the problem is unjust social structures and political mm -hmm. structures, and particularly the power of the privileged. So what you have to do is to smash that power and move it aside and release the oppressed minorities mm -hmm. so they can be free and liberated to express their individuality and their 
uh, to realise themselves. And mm. then this will usher in a whole new kind of utopian mm. society. Uh, but what, what, and what are the dangers, of the, as you see it, of this expressive individualism that's really running hot at the moment? The problem is that... Because it sounds a bit ignorant to me, like we're just all going to do what we want to do and we're going to be fine. Like, well, I was, I'm probably biased because I'm a Christian, I don't have that worldview, but you know, what are the concerns there, do you think? Yeah, um, the problem is, from a Christian perspective, is that sin doesn't go away. Yeah. And if you say, just do what you want to do, be what you want to be, realise yourself, that's not always going to be pretty. Mm. And we, we keep finding out about how human beings have done bad things mm. and, and it distresses us deeply. Mm. And uh, I actually feel sad because sometimes people would say, it's just not acceptable that this happens. It's going to stop. It must stop. You know, <laughs> It's like saying the tide can't come in. I'm not being defeatist by any means. I'm not saying we can't find a remedy to human evil, but it's not just going to go away through education. Yep. Or through My favourite line at the moment is where you just hear, just be kinder, as if we can just like get more kindness and just put that out there it's like just just try it harder try to be kinder and everything will be fine yeah it's like just, like is there is there a pill that we can take that'll stop lust greed you know <laughs> cruelty the desire to dominate the desire to be superior are these things just going to disappear mm. um, and we we don't have solution to that and so mm. another problem that we have is we don't really in the secular mindset we don't really have an explanation for why Christian why human beings have dignity? Mm. Like, why should we value human beings, not for what they do and say and speak or even for their choices, but just for themselves? Mm. That's It's not quite clear to people. Yeah. And one of the dangers is that we'll actually end up having a, a radical um, separation of people into the righteous and the evil ones, you mm. know, the people that deserve to be persecuted because they don't fit our model of what a tolerant... Yeah. righteous human being ought to be. Mm. So we get a kind of new intolerance that comes out of tolerance mm. because there isn't actually um, a clear vision of the worth of a mm. human mm. person. It's um, very unanchored, isn't it, all of this? Very that's the unhinged. risk, yeah. That's the risk. So you just said, love your enemies. But why should you do that? You know, uh, there'd be many people in our culture who say, no, that's not right. I don't want to love my enemies. I mm. want to marginalize them and shut them up, mm, mm. Um, to cancel them. But the consequences of that way of thinking can be horrendous. Mm, mm. That, that's, how, that's how populations get destroyed. Mm, that, that's mm. how injustices prevail. So what is the foundation for justice? Mm. Why should we treat all people equally? I think uh, we have really, really, really difficult ethical issues that we're, we're struggling with. Mm. But it all has to do with... Who, who do we think we are? Yes, and yes. Who are, who are we? And, and it's troubling to me that our nation doesn't have a shared sense of who we are. It is. And I'm well, very aware as a Christian that I'm sort of out of step with my culture. Yeah. Especially when you think, uh, uh, I know this is quite an oversimplification, but if you think are people good or bad, and so we have a nation built on the idea that people are bad, as you said before, we... We, we disseminate power politically and whatever so that no we one separate, can... Yeah. We separate so that no one can come into full control and the states and the federal government, all these things based on this premise of people are bad, people are flawed. Potentially people. bad. So we need to separate the yeah. powers. Yeah, exactly. But then our culture is, has been and is moving very fast to this um, underpinning idea that people are good. So, so how far can we go before... Yeah, so it breaks. <laughs> the danger is for us, if we have this ideology that people are basically good, is that we undo the separation of powers. Okay. And you'll see politicians beginning to take over the role of the police or of the judiciary mm. or whatever. Mm. Uh, and there'll be a blurring of that separation. Mm. Mm. Uh, and people won't value it because they'll just see, oh, my position is, is right. Yeah. And um, I suppose you see that when it comes to um, institutions going out of their lane, like the classic for me is, um, you know, like your big companies, like your tech companies or Nike or whatever, all of a sudden have a, a, a cultural cultural commentators and they have political positions. They're and moral like, agitators. Don't you they? sell sports shoes? <laughs> or, like, yeah. or you get the athlete, the 25-year-old professional athlete who's a brilliant footballer or a basketballer and then all of a sudden they have a huge influence on who we should vote for or they think that 
this is good or that is, but it's like, but don't you play basketball? And so there's this, um, I suppose, meshing, like you're saying, of, 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 of people, uh, experts, institutions, uh, free to go out of their lane to make comments on things that they don't know That's about true. and grab for power. It becomes more about power and influence, not about, but you play basketball, you're not a politician. <laughs> you know, you asked that question, what is the, the fundamental problem? I think the fundamental problem in the, in the current mindset is, is power. Mm that some people have and others don't, and mm. it needs to be redistributed. Mm. But redistribution of power will not make people good. Yeah. And it, it didn't make them good in, in, in communism. Yeah. Uh, it, it actually can produce disastrous results. So, mm. yeah, we're really struggling around those issues. Yeah, my concern is just that, that w w when does it break? Because I, I feel like your average Aussie probably thinks, yeah, there's lots of cultural things going on and arguments and whatever, but we'll always be okay. We'll always have a house. We'll always go to the footy. But you just wonder, like, is it is it going to be okay? And is it going to be okay for my children or my grandchildren? And If you'd have said in 1900 in Germany that the Germans were going to kill millions of Jews <laughs> and burn them, burn their bodies in, in concentration camps, people would have said that's impossible. It could never happen in yeah. Germany. But it happened. Um, and it's important not to underestimate the potential of evil. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to be vigilant. I don't mean to be kind of doomsday prophesying, but yeah, we do have troubling trends in our mm. culture. And I think, I mean, I think pastors should be training their churches for persecution. We'd be training our, our communities for resilience in the mm. face of evil. Mm. And that sort of she'll be right. It's very arrogant that, our, you know, our system is just going to go on forever and ever and yeah. nothing will threaten it it's yeah it's 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 not it's not what the bible says no about the world mm. and its trajectory do, do you do you think there's a little bit of um what they call historical snobbery kind of um just a historical uh kind of generation that really doesn't know and is ignorant to the past and doesn't really care or respect the past do, do you see that as a bit of a problem i think the issue is that we've bought into this rosy view of history is progress, that things are getting better and better. And the way to learn that that's not the case is to study the past yeah. and ask why did the Holocaust happen and why did the Gulag happen? And any kind of really serious answer to those questions would undermine that belief that things are just progressing and mm. things are going to keep going and getting better. And so it's convenient to forget the past mm. because we can't sustain our current view of human beings as essentially good if we take the past seriously. Mm. And so we, we ignore it because it's too much cognitive dissonance to understand it. Yep. Um, and, and, that's and, and also, I suppose, that history then isn't valued within a progressive mindset because, well, it's all about the future and the future's better and whatever happened is not really a lesson. People it's were just ignorant a, then. Yeah, they yeah, weren't as evolved. They didn't know stuff. And yeah. 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 I mean, what, someone once said to me, you, you should crawl back into your cave. And I, I, I should have said, do you really think the future's guaranteed to be better? And the mm. people that come after you will be um, more evolved and better and more wise than you are. You know, do you think history provides evidence for that trend? Mm. You know, mm. tell me about that. Mm. Because, yeah, people... People build their picture of the world that they're comfortable with mm. and that will sustain their lifestyle and their views. Mm. They don't necessarily build a picture of the world that's based on the evidence of history. Mm. Mm. So yeah, history is important for us. Mm. And what did you think, talking about uh, Christianity and culture and the church, you mentioned before about pastors training their people to be resilient and all of that. What, what, what did you think of that now that we're on the other side of COVID and the lockdowns, well, not on the other side of COVID, but maybe the lockdowns are on the other side of. What did you think of the church's general response? Were you surprised um, by the tension and the emotion created by COVID, uh, especially the, uh, I suppose, um, vaccinations and the mandates of the, the, the church um, seemed to split in some regard about those things? I was surprised by the intensity of the division that you were, occurred okay. in many churches. Mm -hmm. And I felt, uh, having sort of just left that ministry just as it started, I was sort of relieved not to be in the firing line. But I mm. think for many pastors, it was perplexing and troubling to see their own members that, you know, really at each other's throats in quite a deep way, mm. disagreeing so violently. And 
seemingly having trouble even being able to have a conversation mm, mm. about it. I think the pandemic has triggered off or tapped into very deep fears that people have, mm. a lack of trust, anxiety about things that are happening in the world. Mm. And for some, it sort of pushed that into a f sharp focus. Mm -hmm. And others obviously didn't respond in that way. So I'm still struggling to understand the depth of that. Um, I, I do think that the, the mandates went, out, went too far and mm. this has caused anxieties about what's happening in society to come to the surface. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it is, it is struggling. And I think I'm still thinking about that and what, yeah. why, why there was such a deep response. I mean, I had some people... I, I, I wrote a blog post saying why I'd been vaccinated and why, mm. based on love of your neighbours yourself, why I did that as a Christian. Not saying other people, they should do the same. Yeah. Just to say, well, this is what, how I've thought about it. And I, I did lose a few friends. And I was mm. shocked because you have a close and, and trusting relationship with someone for many years. And then suddenly they just write you off their list and or just over the fact that you took the vaccination that or I, more that, that I expressed those views yeah that, that you I, said that so. I wasn't totally up in arms about the risk of one world government and you know the destruction of our way of life as I know as we know it because mm. of what the government was doing I mean I disagree with the mandates but I supported the push to vaccination so you know your views are complex but I was just shocked by how difficult it was to have a conversation with some people mm. about it well, do, do you have any thoughts around why it did push that button so so kind of violently? I, I think there's a deep anxiety about what's happening in the world. Mm. And, and it just brought it up. And it just brought of, this, yeah. this lack of trust. Yeah, okay. Uh, and so it was simmering and it was almost like this was the flashpoint. Um, I think there's a, there's a lot less trust in our culture than there was 20, 30 years ago. Mm, mm. People um, are more cynical and... Uh, they're concerned about politicians and mm. and and it was very intrusive on people's daily lives. You know, it was very personal. Very, yeah. It affected people very specifically. And I, I think those that, for various conscientious or other reasons, didn't want to be vaccinated, felt abused by being excluded mm. um, in lots of areas, and that was shocking to people. Mm -hmm. Like it's like this must be something really wrong if I, I lose my job as a shop assistant because I don't get a vaccination. They, mm. they couldn't comprehend that. Um, and I think we're still processing, you know, we're sure. still actually even trying to work out whether the lockdowns were effective you yeah, know, and yeah. what, 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 how necessary were there. And, and you know, we're comparing different countries mm. and how they were. So we're still working that out. But to me, it's a warning, like our, our, our base is not as strong as we'd like it to be. Yeah. The consensus, the glue that holds us together is not working as effective as we'd like it to mm, be. Mm. And if we get another crisis, a worse crisis, um, how will we hold it together? It's a great point. Mm. It was a bit of a litmus test like that, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was really fascinating as a pastor. And I think for me, just just seeing people's maybe capacity to handle the crisis was really interesting. Um, not, not, not judging that or saying they should be stronger or they should be more spiritual or anything, but it was more that just... Um, something, this brought that to the surface quite evidently, like people couldn't hide much anymore, like things hung out a little bit. And it was interesting, the emotional capacity to handle it, the, the, the a Christian's ability uh, to have hope in God despite the circumstances. Absolutely. People struggle to separate that, I think believe that theologically and on paper, you know, our hope is in Christ, but then... When push came to shove with something that was fairly full on and personal in our own homes locked away, it was like a lot of that um, faith appeared to evaporate very quickly and it became a bit more of a militant political uh, issue that needed to be fought. And I think there was some, you know, there was some truth in that as well, like you said, with the mandates and I, I, I probably a similar position, like some of it was a bit over the top. And But it's also very easy to sit here as a pastor out in suburban Melbourne, like I'm not running a state or running a nation yeah. and essentially shooting in the dark uh, in a global pandemic. Like I think that that's difficult as well. But I think the deeper issues are, are what we need to look at, the mistrust and, and, and those things. I think they're things we can learn from. Um, I think the issues were complex. Like Very complex. I'm not an epidemiologist, mm. you know, and and yes, big big pharmacy companies can try and manipulate the market to their benefit, and maybe that's part of it as well. And 
They probably do a little bit. Yeah, they, they, they? I'm sure they do. <laughs> you know, like, and how do you balance up these these factors? And um, you know, lots of people who made errors and did the wrong thing. So it's yeah, it's actually really. It, and yet we live. We also live in this world where through social media, people have lots of access to data. And, That's interesting. And people yeah. are reading very different sources. So mm. one person's reading all these sources, another's reading all these sources, and they're getting completely different information mm. about what's happening mm. in the world. Mm. Uh, so people begin to kind of gravitate into their, their, their pool of their contacts, mm. and that's the only thing they get exposed to. So that's that's a that's another problem with the world in yeah, which we yeah. live that we we become divided by it, by the sources that we end up mm. slipping into, yeah. and, and we ha lose the capacity to say, well, what's the breadth of information available? Mm. And we say, oh no, I'm I'm listening to these people, and they're telling me the truth. Mm. And so that's a, that that also bodes badly, I think, for mm. for our ability to hold it all together mm. as a nation. Mm. Mm. Definitely. Well, maybe my final question for you. Uh, it's a bit of a broad one, but uh, so we call this podcast leadership lessons. What 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 would you say has been one of your biggest lessons? Maybe you can give us a couple if that's too hard. The biggest lessons over the journey as a pastor, an academic, a writer. A... Well, one thing that's really spoken to me is this that. Um, you know, there's an image of the leader that the leader should be the strong person who can cast a vision and inspire people to go forward boldly yeah. together. You yeah. know, vision casting leader. Yeah, um, and that's one, kind of my Pentecostal world. <laughs> exactly. Does that happened in the Anglican world. <laughs> I'm sure you get a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, this charismatic guy, and you think, oh, here we go. Yeah. And one of my friends said to me, you know, imagine. You're in the trenches and someone says, let's go now. And they jump over the trench, you know, and they run into no man's land. And about 20, 30 paces in, they look back and they see there's not a single soul following. <laughs> and he said, that's like the straw man of leadership, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I, I thought about that a lot. And I thought, actually, as a leader, I really want to know what the motivations and the drivers are for the people I'm leading. Mm. And what is their burning passion? Mm. And what, where is God, what vision is God casting in them? Mm. So I found that really important in leadership Fantastic. before casting my vision was to say, what does the Lord put on your heart? Mm. Or people would say, I'd like to serve. I say, well, what does the Lord put in your heart to serve? Where is your, where is your passion? So mm. to trust that God would speak through the people that you lead and mm. to involve them in that conversation. Mm. So when you jump over the over the, out of the trench, you suddenly find you've got 100 people behind yeah, you and yeah. not no one at all, and you're the only person the enemy is shooting yeah. at. <laughs> so I found that really important, that there's a kind of humility to to engage with people's hopes and dreams and vision and to lead. There's a time for casting vision, but it needs to be informed by that process mm, first. Mm. So I found that very powerful and helpful. That's, that's a great leadership lesson. So more of a collaborative, go to people, know their hearts, lead from within the group, I suppose, as opposed to a running off ahead uh, using charisma or other things to compel people to come. I, I really love that. I think, I think probably, in my opinion, you know, that kind of leadership is also uh, more important than ever before with our current younger generations and the way coming through. I think the, maybe the control and command or the, uh, even in the church world, the charismatic leader is probably that style has taken a bit of a hit in the last decade and there's been a few, you know, big guys fall and it's made us really question is that it's definitely an element of leadership, as you say, but if it's all that, um, you know, is that really going to, is that really going to really work? So I've found that if you listen to people's dreams and visions and you're informed by it and they know that you're taking that really seriously, when you stand up and cast the vision, they know that they've been part of that process. Yes, yes, yes. And they've, they've contributed. They've contributed and yeah. they own it and that you've listened to them. Mm. And that they've also heard you because you've interacted with them. And, mm. and you get a much higher level of, of commitment mm. and willingness mm. to, to stay the distance when you've done that, I mm. found. Mm. It's more time consuming mm. and it requires a humility and the grace to listen to people and mm. to think, maybe I can learn something here. But the fruit, it's a great the fruit point. is great. The fruit it's a great, is great point. Because essentially you're handing over your positional power that you could cast a vision or you could force a direction. You're essentially handling that over by coming and saying, what do you think? Well, these are some things God's saying, but what's God saying to you? And could you help me lead better? And could I help you follow better? And 
And that essentially is really a handing over of power and control and saying, I'll use my position to include everyone that we can be better as opposed to I'll use my position to try and coerce you to come on a certain direction and it doesn't. It, it requires humility, it requires a lot of prayer and uh, following, and trusting following that, Christ. Trusting that God's at work in the church. That's it. Yeah. He's, he's, uh, you, you're not going to be overrun by the barbarians if you start <laughs> listening to people. Uh, you, you know, don't exploit people's loyalty. Yes. Um, you cultivate it, encourage it and make it a, um, a considered and wise loyalty, not just a, a demanded one. Right. Well, thank you very much, Mark, for being on the uh, Leadership Lessons podcast today. Pleasure, Caleb. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I trust you were impacted by that Leadership Lessons podcast. I would love to hear your thoughts about today's podcast. Please comment down below and please review the podcast and share it with a friend. Doing this inspires us and helps others to find the podcast. See you next time.